Hi everyone, Dr. Hinky here. Uh, this video lecture is going to cover both chapters 13 and 14. That's because chapter 13, the only portion you are responsible for is section 13.3, so it's pretty short. So 13.3 is about genetic mutations, and a gene mutation is a permanent change in the sequence of bases in DNA. We can have other mistakes during transcription or translation that can uh, result in illness or disease, but when we're talking about mutations, we are talking about a change in the DNA. So it is passed on during every round of mitosis to the subsequent cells, that same change, uh, or if it's in a germ cell, it is passed on in the production of the gametes. So mutation is a permanent change in the base of DNA. The effects of a gene mutation uh, can range from no effect on protein activity at all. So we can have changes in the DNA that do not lead to any change in the phenotype or complete inactivation of the protein. This can lead to uh, diseases and disorders, to faulty metabolism. Uh, many of those genetic disorders that you researched earlier, uh, the enzymatic that had an, an enzymatic function, malfunction that led to those are due to a single mutation in the DNA and many times having an inactive or ineffective protein, and sometimes they can be fatal. So germline mutations occur in sex cells. The mutation has to occur in a sex cell in order to be passed on to the offspring. Somatic mutations occur in body cells. We don't pass on our body cells to our offspring. They get all of their genetics, uh, all of their DNA, all their chromosomes, everything through the sperm and the eggs. So only changes in the tissue that produce sperm and eggs can be passed on. It's gene mutations. We talk about mutations as a spontaneous event. Typically we have spontaneous mutations. There is a known background rate of mutation. Uh, and that is about one in every billion nucleotide pairs that are replicated. So throughout my Mitosis, every time we make a copy of uh, our chromosomes in the S phase, about one every billion base pairs will get a spontaneous random change to one of those uh, nitrogenous bases. So chemical changes uh, in DNA lead to mispairing during replication. So the the complementary base pair, if I have a mutation uh, in one of my base pairs, A, C, G, or T, that changes it to one of the other ones, then when it's copied, the complement will be changed as well. We're going to have movement of transposons from one chromosomal location to another. We're going to learn more about transposons in chapter 15, but those are segments of our genes that do actually uh, move from one location to another, and that can lead to errors if they insert themselves in the wrong place. Replication errors, so we can have our, uh, during the S phase, rather than just have a random change, uh, we can have an error, our DNA polymerase may insert the incorrect base. Typically, DNA polymerase is a great proofreader for new, stand, uh, new strands of DNA, and so it will correct those errors. But every now and then, one slips through. Those are spontaneous mutations. We also have a class of mutations called induced mutations. These are called by mutagens, mutagenic agents, uh, radiation, so solar radiation, gamma radiation. Uh, radiation can cause spontaneous mutations, breaks in the DNA, uh, new bonds forming between base pairs that cause changes in the reading and the transcription and translation. Uh, many organic chemicals, pesticides, are mutagens. Many mutagens are also carcinogens or cancer-causing. There are environmental mutagens like uh, ultraviolet radiation and tobacco smoke. 
that cause or increase our rate of mutation. So they are known to cause or increase rates of mutation. There are different types of mutations. You can have point mutations. These occur um, at one single nucleotide in the DNA. One type of point mutation is a base substitution. So one of those nitrogenous bases is replaced with another. So it's a single nucleotide replacement of adenine, thymine, cytosine, or guanine by a different uh, nitrogenous base. So we change in transcription, that changes our codon, and in translation, that changes our amino acid. How that actually affects the end product of, product of our DNA, the protein that it codes for, depends on what the change is. It could render the protein non-functional, meaning whatever that enzyme's end product is won't get made. It can have reduced functionality. It won't be able to do its job as well. Or it can be unaffected. We call that a silent mutation. So those are point mutations, one single base pair. It can also have frame shift mutations. This occurs when we either have one or two nucleotides inserted or deleted from the DNA. So a frame shift uh, means we move our reading frame. So our reading frame is typically three bases at a time, three of those nitrogenous bases, the codon. So by inserting or deleting some, we shift the way we read that. So an example, if you think of uh, our codons are the, those nitrogenous bases as letters, here is a set of triplets. Uh, we're going to use that as words. The cat ate the rat. So that would be our normal. These are codons that are in the correct order. A deletion would be eliminating one of these bases. And that would change the reading frame because we're still going to read by threes. But if I eliminated this C, then I would have three, the. But without that C, my next three would be one, two, three, at a, then the next three, tet, her, at. So we've just shifted this. This um, change in all the codons will lead to either replaced amino acids that won't have the, uh, the correct bonding pattern to get the ultimate three-dimensional shape of that protein. Could just end protein synthesis completely and we wouldn't get that uh, protein, that enzyme at all. Uh, so that's one way to shift the frame is by deleting uh, one base or inserting. So if I put a, another C, insert a C here, that's going to move my reading frame as well. I'm still reading three letters at a time. They have the k k tap eth erat and I have uh, nonsense. So here's a point mutation. For look, here is my normal DNA with my complementary base pairing to, uh, this is my template strand on top, and this is the complementary base pairing during transcription to create this messenger RNA. T's code for an A, A's for U, C's for G's, and so on. Uh, and this is my correct chain of amino acids. Here, these base pairs, this is showing a segment of our DNA that codes for hemoglobin uh, with a point mutation, a base substitution. In this case, the thymine here is replaced with an adenine. In my DNA, that now codes for a different complement when I am transcribing my messenger RNA. Instead of having GAA in this second uh, codon, I have GUA. That, during translation, is going to change my amino acid to valine from glutamate. So that results in misfolding. That's an incorrect primary structure for my ultimate protein of hemoglobin. It's going to lead to incorrect uh, folding in the 
secondary uh, in the secondary structure, which will lead to an inappropriate three-dimensional shape in the tertiary. Hemoglobin has four of those, those tertiary polypeptides that come together to give hemoglobin its final shape. And then we have billions of hemoglobin molecules, each able to carry four oxygens, packed into our red blood cells. The misshapen hemoglobin results in a misshapen red blood cell. So here is a red blood cell filled with lots of correctly shaped uh, hemoglobin molecules carrying oxygen. That misshapen protein, when they fill the red blood cell, we get a sickle shape instead. This leads to clotting problems. These do not flow and tumble as well. Uh, they stick together and stack, so I get clotting problems. They're not able to carry as much oxygen to so have circulatory and metabolic energy related problems associated with sickle cell, all because of that one base substitution. Sometimes a base substitution can lead to a silent mutation. That's because of the redundancy in the genetic code. It offers us some protection from adverse impacts. That redundancy, we see wobble room in this third pair. I can make a mistake here and I'm gonna get the right amino acid. I can substitute either one of those two and get the right amino acid. I have all four of these options in this third pair to get the correct amino acid. So I have some protection here through this redundancy, not complete protection, but I have multiple ways to get many of my amino acids. Uh, so for example, I could have a base pair substitution here. This is my normal DNA strand. And let's say in this position, I have a T, that means my transcribed mRNA would have an A, and I would have valine. If I had a base pair substitution here and that T was changed to an A, then my messenger RNA codon would be changed to GUU. Ah, GUA gives me valine. GUU also gives me valine. This is called a silent mutation. There is a change in the DNA, so it is a mutation but the end product remains the same. And so we would not see that in the phenotype or in the protein expressed by this. So here are other point mutations. This is an example of a base substitution that we just talked about, an addition, and here's a deletion where I would change the reading frame. And then in my ribosome at the A, P, and E sites, the codon would be shifted, and from the point of that mutation onward, I would have the wrong reading frame. Some gene mutations uh, can cause cancer. So often the development of cancer involves a series of accumulating mutations. Proto-oncogenes are genes that stimulate cell division, mitosis. So proto-oncogenes are going to uh, make mitosis, encourage mitosis. Mutated proto-oncogenes become oncogenes. That means these are always active. So those proto-oncogenes control cell division. They stimulate it, but they also control it and stop it when it's done um, or having Properly working proto-oncogenes ensure it only happens when it's supposed to. Oncogenes, we don't get the turn off, the stop dividing signal. So tumor suppressor, tumor suppressor genes inhibit cell division. Uh, if we have mutations in oncogenes or in tumor suppressor genes, they can stimulate the cell cycle uncontrollably controllably, we get lots and lots of cells that are not differentiating and not doing their job, and that's called a tumor. We may still get a protein from a mutation. We may still have a string of amino acids, our polypeptide, and it's able to fold. 
Uh, it's able to get a three-dimensional shape, just not the correct three-dimensional shape. So a faulty, uh, if we have that faulty enzyme, in the case of enzyme proteins with a mutation, that faulty enzyme is inserted into a metabolic pathway, which remember all of our metabolism, metabolism, the sum total of chemical reactions in a cell, every chemical reaction in the cell is catalyzed with an enzyme. So this is our critical class of proteins. Um, faulty enzyme will bring about a halt or an incomplete or faulty um, step within a metabolic pathway and can have serious consequences. And those metabolic uh, disorders that you researched, PKU is one of those. Um, those, this is the result. These are the results of mutations. This is how they're passed on. Uh, Let's see, so those, and remember all the different roles those proteins had, we had all those classes of proteins on cell surfaces. Some of those were receptors and their job is to receive chemical messages that trigger appropriate responses. Um, for example, we have receptors that respond or are the receiving surface proteins, molecules on cell surfaces for testosterone uh, to trigger the onset of puberty. And if we have a misshapen protein receptor in the cell surface, we can miss that. So uh, androgen insensitivity, we have a misshapen protein and end up with female instead of male genitals and female instead of male secondary sex uh, secondary sex characteristics during puberty uh, in an XY male. All right, chapter 14, our biotech. The lab is really going to help to clarify a lot of the information in this chapter and the portions that we need. Uh, this is just going to give you a lot of examples. Should we talk about cloning, about biotech products, gene therapy, and genomics? There are some examples um, about using tobacco plants to treat dental disease. So in, in dogs, I know many of you are considering the vet tech program. So this could be of interest for you as research areas. Uh, dental disease is a major concern for veterinarians because those bacteria that cause dental disease uh, can also produce toxins that can enter the bloodstream and damage organs. This is also true in humans with dental disease. So those of you looking at dental hygiene programs, uh, this is also a concern. Researchers have modified tobacco plants to produce vaccines against streptococcus mutants, which is one of the uh, pathogens, one of the bacteria involved in building biofilms on the teeth that become plaque. They've also bioengineered, bioengineered the bacteria itself to create strains that are harmless and that are able to wash away. They can't stick to the teeth to build plaque and wash away with saliva. We also use biotechnology. We use the processes we talk about in this chapter to modify bacteria in order to get helpful products, things like insulin or biodegrading bacteria that degrade organic compounds, specifically organic pollutants like petroleum hydrocarbon uh, or other organic harmful organic or persistent organic pollutants. And we can use genetic modification and cloning to produce specific protein and plants uh, that are altered for pest resistance or to increase their nutrient value. So cloning, cloning, we talked about cloning when we talked about mitosis. Cloning is the production of identical copies of DNA cells or organisms. So all the members of a bacterial colony on a Petri dish are clones because they all came from the division of one cell. So we put a single cell on that plate and it undergoes binary fission again and again and again until there's a whole colony. Identical twins are clones. Identical or monozygotic twins come from a single embryo. So one egg, fertilized or was fertilized by one sperm and that 
uh, fertilized embryo began to undergo mitosis. And at some point that growing mass of cells split into two. So they are genetically identical. And then those two that split continued undergoing mitosis to grow. Gene cloning is the production of many identical copies of the same gene. So we can just clone, se select out individual genes that we are interested in um, and make lots of copies of those. We can insert that gene uh, and have it expressed, right? Remember, we just went through that. Gene expression is taking that gene, going through transcription and translation to get a protein, whatever the product of that gene is. And we can use that. So lots and lots of research purposes for cloned genes and identifying what they do and, and using them uh, for therapy. For example, humans can be treated with gene therapy with copies of those cloned genes. When we look at DNA cloning, we can talk about recombinant DNA. So our DNA, recombinant DNA, is DNA that contains DNA from two or more different sources. So we can clone a gene from one organism and insert it into another, and that is recombinant DNA. Why would we do that? We'll talk about that in just a minute, but in order to make recombinant DNA, we need a vector. A vector is some way to introduce the gene that we are interested in or the segment of DNA we're interested in into a host cell. So plasmids, which are small little extra chromosomal DNA in bacteria, are really common vectors. Uh, they move from cell to cell. Bacteria can make copies of those plas plasmids and share them with other cells readily. Bacteria have um, the ability to do that. And so they're kind of ready-made to help with this process. So we use plasmids often as the vector. And we need some enzymes to help introduce foreign DNA um, into vector DNA. And those enzymes are restriction enzymes. These cut DNA, so they will clip DNA at specific points. And DNA ligase, if you remember from our discussion of uh, of DNA and DNA replication. Ligase is the enzyme that sealed together those Okazaki fragments or that goes in and uh, reseals DNA that's been cut when DNA polymerase makes a correction to a mistake. So DNA ligase, this is a, the gluing enzyme. So let's say we want to clone a specific gene in humans, one that uh, we've been doing for decades, we're very familiar with, is the gene for making insulin. And so we can add the restriction enzyme, right? that's the one that cuts the DNA. We can add the restriction enzyme to a plasmid from a bacteria, and that restriction enzyme will cut that. We can extract the human DNA from a human cell and use restriction enzymes to cut at the exact specific location where the insulin gene is located. And we'll talk about how we identify that, how we pick the enzyme to clip this part. And then we put these together along with some DNA ligase and it will come in and sew that back up or glue it back together. Now our plasmid contains DNA from a human that codes for how to make insulin. That plasmid gets put back into the bacteria. The host cell will take that up because bacteria do that, swap these things all the time. And now uh, as the bacteria undergoes binary fission uh, and begins to express its genes, it will make more copies of that. Every time it undergoes binary fission, we get more bacteria that have that gene for making insulin. And as the bacteria undergoes metabolism, it does its job, it will express that gene and that gene tells it to make insulin. That's how we harvest. That is commercially how we get insulin. 
So if we go through the step-by-step, -step, restriction enzymes cut DNA at specific points, and those specific points are dictated by these base pairs. It will cleave the vector, the plasmid, and the foreign, or the, in this case, the human DNA, at these specific points. The specific point where it cleaves will leave what are called sticky ends. So now all I, all I have to do is the same restriction enzyme cutting this segment right here of DNA from a human gene and this segment from a bacterial plasmid, oh, they have complements. So now when they come together, they will find the complementary pair, and that's how we insert that. So those sticky ends allow the insertion of the foreign DNA into vector DNA. Then the DNA ligase comes in and seals that back up. I now have my recombinant DNA, a plasmid, a ring of DNA that has a gene for how to make insulin in the case, the example we used. Uh, and once that is taken back up by a bacterial cell, um, through transformation, bacterial cells can just take in extra pieces of uh, DNA from the environment around them. Uh, then every time we make a copy of that bacteria through binary fission, we get new organisms that have that gene and can express it. So a technology that has really uh, let genetic research and the uses of um, of gene cloning take off into all sorts of new uses and realms. It's called polymerase chain reaction or PCR. PCR amplifies a segment of DNA. By amplifies, it means it copies it rapidly. So we go from a single copy of, of a gene to millions of copies fairly quickly. And we do that by just doing the normal process that DNA goes through to be copied, DNA replication. Uh, if I have all of my source materials, so I have my nitrogenous bases and my five carbon sugar and phosphate and DNA polymerase, DNA polymerase is ACE, the enzyme that makes copies of DNA. I put that all together and chemical reactions will take place. And that's what DNA replication is. DNA polymerase will do its job and start adding bases. Uh, we now are able to do this. We used to have to uh, heat up this kind of soup of all the raw materials in order to separate, break the hydrogen bonds between the two strands of DNA, and then let that cool so that the, and then add all the new bases and add DNA polymerase so that DNA polymerase could go to work. And then you'd have to heat it up again to separate the strands. But by heating it up, what happens to enzymes when you add heat, they denature. So then we'd have to wait, cool it down to add more DNA polymerase. And every round we'd have to keep adding new raw materials. Uh, now, in order to do polymerase chain reaction, we actually extract DNA polymerase from a bacteria called Thermus aquaticus. It lives in um, hot springs, in, in geysers, in hot water, so it can withstand the high temperature that we have to subject the DNA to to separate those double strands so that DNA polymerase can get in there and get to work. We also have to continuously supply nucleotides. So we have to start with lots and lots so that DNA polymerase can keep building those complementary strands. And every time uh, we go through a cycle of replication, we double the amount of DNA. So if this is our segment that we want, we heat and denature the DNA, separate those two strands, put in our, uh, our primers. That's what tells DNA polymerase where to start working. And then our DNA polymerase goes to work adding bases. Oh, then I've replicated my original strand of DNA and I now have two strands of DNA and again and again and again. So we can get lots and lots of strands of DNA really, really quickly. 
the reason this is so important is for sensitivity for a lot of tests a lot of the reasons a lot of the things we use this a single strand of dna would be hard to detect hard to see hard to study hard to study if we want to get products out of it the more dna that we have making that end product the better so we want to increase the numbers um, and for uh, the process you are all familiar with from lab gel electrophoresis in order to add dye and see those genes as they migrate through the gel we have to have sufficient quantity that it becomes visible to the naked eye so we need to make lots and lots of copies so some of the applications of PCR uh, a lot of these are just we want to analyze DNA segments to so use what are called STR or short tandem repeats uh, to profile or to get to analyze DNA fragment links so we treat DNA segments with restriction enzymes that cut the DNA at a specific location and what those that as we saw the base pairs indicate the specific location so we'll have a unique collection of fragments of different lengths different individuals will have different sized fragments because we carry different alleles and different genes so when we cut those the genes will have different weights different lengths gel electrophoresis is a process of adding an electrical current to a gel our dna has a slight negative charge and so that electric current makes it migrate to the positive pole through the gel and when we do this those fragments of dna separate out with shorter pieces moving faster so they progress farther through the gel heavier long longer larger pieces of dna don't go as far so we get the separation based on the size of the fragments and each person has different sized um, fragments because of the differences in base pairing at the genes so then we can um, measure these look at the pattern in the gel so as you can see each individual even though we cut at the same that restriction enzyme cuts at the same sequence of nitrogenous bases what's in between those sequences will differ in length so here's an example of using it to establish paternity so what we see on Mori Povich this is mom's pattern of DNA migration through the gel half of her genes went to her child and the other half came from dad so all of the possible fathers would also have their DNA um, cut into these short repeating units and amplified through PCR and then run through the gel the shorter pieces would extend further through the uh, through the gel oh, coming this way but what we'd want to do is okay child got that from mom doesn't have this one so didn't get it from dad from mom so must have gotten oh sorry mom doesn't have this one so the child must have gotten that from dad so we have to find a match in dad mom doesn't have this had to have gotten it from dad mom has this one the kid doesn't have anything there didn't get that one um, doesn't have a a slice that size has this for mom this from mom must have gotten that from dad must have gotten that from dad and so you match up if you didn't get it from mom you had to have gotten it from dad so you look for the possible father that has these same segments and male one is dad All right so what are some uh, biotechnology products what are we going to use this for uh, when we talk about biotechnology which is talking about using these ways we manipulate genes uh, to enhance organisms genomes so we talk about genetically engineered organisms or genetically modified organisms uh, we use these to produce biotechnology products these are organisms that have had a foreign gene inserted into them so we say they are transgenic 
they have different genes in them. So transgenic bacteria, we take that gene of interest, put it in a bacteria, grow the bacteria um, in what are called bioreactors, where the gene is copied, passed on, and then expressed, and we harvest the protein. Uh, so some of those that are that we use now are insulin. We use uh, this process to get vaccines like the hepatitis B vaccine and to gather human growth hormone. So we can use them to uh, produce chemical products as well. So we can use transgenic bacteria to help develop frost resistant uh, strawberries. We can use biotechnology to use transgenic microorganisms or other organisms like plants to detoxify and degrade environmental pollutants. There are a number of bacteria that do this naturally that break down pollutants. Um, but if we need to amplify the number, we need to increase the number for a large oil spill. If we just let this occur naturally, uh, might take too long and there would be damage to other habitats and organisms before the bacteria were able to break it down sufficiently. So we can actually take those genes and put them into other organisms, to transgenic organisms to modify them. Uh, bacteria that naturally occur in the area. It's really hard to take bacteria from one area. So if we harvest them from one area, knowing that they have the ability to break down, for example, petroleum hydrocarbons and put them somewhere else, uh, they may not perform as well in that new area. So we can take naturally occurring bacteria from one area and introduce the gene that lets them break down the petroleum um, so that they are in their normal habitat, but now have the ability to do something they didn't before. So we can use those to clean up beaches, to clean up oil spills. Uh, typically, the bacteria, the naturally occurring bacteria that are able to use uh, an organic, uh, organic toxic product like petroleum hydrocarbons or pesticides, if they can use that as a carbon source, then once they have eaten up all the let's say petroleum hydrocarbon, its food source is gone uh, and most of them will starve to death and those that don't will just be in low numbers in the population um, as the normal population uh, reestablishes itself, the other bacteria that live in the area. In some cases, we might be concerned that the bacteria that are either introduced or that are modified will end up altering the normal food chains or the normal biogeochemical processes in an area. So we want, we don't want them to stick around after the job is done, especially if we introduce them from a different area, they're not found in the area. Uh, so in these cases, you can introduce a suicide gene so that the bacteria self-destructs once their carbon source is gone. Uh, this is someone working on biodegradation. This is what my uh, graduate research was on biodegradation of persistent organic pollutants by microbes and marine environments. Some other biotechnology products, genetically modified plants can introduce foreign genes um, into plants and then use those to give the plants uh, the ability to produce an insect toxin so that insects don't harm them. They kill the insects before they do. Resistance to common herbicides uh, and to increase shelf life, for example, in apples by uh, eliminating the gene for browning. Uh, we can use those to produce human hormones. So we have plants that are bioengineered to produce proteins like different human hormones, clotting factors, and antibodies that will uh, prevent illness, present, treat diseases, uh, attack tumor cells, or we can use those for vaccines. Genetically modified animals, it's interesting, you can insert genes into the eggs of animals uh, through microinjection. So we mix the eggs in an agitator with DNA and little silicon carbide needles so that we can make tiny holes 
uh, in the egg so that the DNA is able to enter into the cell without destroying that egg. Then the fertilized egg is developed into a transgenic animal with DNA from another organism. This has been used to introduce genes for bovine growth hormone uh, into eggs so that we get larger organisms for meat production. We can use transgenic animals for gene farming. Notice this is pH, pharmaceutical purposes. So we can use genes that code for therapeutic and diagnostic proteins, incorporate those into an animal's DNA, and then we get those proteins in the animal's milk. And there's potential uh, to use this to get products that can treat cystic fibrosis, cancer, and various blood diseases. You can use transgenic animals um, to do studies on development. Um, some of the things that we can look at is removing sections of chromosomes to see what, what will happen. We can inject single mouse embryos. We can alter. This can be used to treat um, a lot of those disorders that we talked about with having uh, incorrect chromosome numbers. Uh, a knockout mouse. So knockout organisms are some that both alleles of a gene are removed or they're made non-functional. We've knocked out that gene. Uh, and we can use those. So the, a knockout mouse, the example given in the book was a knockout mouse, where the gene for cystic fibrosis uh, is removed or it's knocked out. So don't have that. But the mutant version of the mouse um, has a phenotype similar to humans with cystic fibrosis. So we have altered its genome. It expresses same, uh, the same protein as cystic fibrosis. So that um, protein, the pump, the calcium pump is not functioning, or the chloride pump, sorry, and it can be used to test, that mouse can now be used to test new drug treatments. Since we have now basically given it this disease. All right, so when we talk about gene therapy, what we're talking about is replacing faulty genes with healthy ones. Uh, so we can use those genes to treat genetic disorders or human illness. There are two approaches. We can have ex vivo uh, gene therapy and in vivo. Ex vivo is outside the body. In vivo is inside. Uh, ex vivo, we can create the enzyme. So in this case, the gene, we use the gene to make the enzyme and then we provide that enzyme. So the product is made outside of the body, the gene is used and expressed outside and the product is introduced. And in vivo, we try to incorporate that correct gene or the incorrect gene, the faulty gene with a healthy gene. So inserting, inserting that gene into the person's genome to try to correct the disorder. And there are some examples uh, of research into this area, uh, different diseases and illnesses that have the potential to be treated using gene therapy. The last section of the chapter is going to talk about some different applications, genomics. Genomics is a study of genomes of humans and other organisms. Uh, and the big blockbuster research in this in the past 20 years was the Human Genome Project, which was identifying all the base pairs in all the chromosomes in humans. It took 13 years to sequence 3 billion base pairs along the length of all 46 human chromosomes. The project involved universities and private labs throughout the world. It was really actually private funding and a private individual uh, who pushed this because funding was very limited. So it kind of became competition between uh, universities, between public research, publicly funded research institutes and private labs. And that competition accelerated the pace of discovery. And now, it's a little bit more of a partnership than, initial, than it originally was. 
So the genome is all the genetic information of an individual or of a species. The goal of the Human Genome Project was to determine the base pair sequence um, so that we could identify disorders and illnesses and fix those, find uh, which parts of the chromosome coded for what uh, on each specific chromosome, so that ultimately we would be able to use that information to fix everything. Uh, turns out, found all sorts of unexpected results. Things like portion of the population has Neanderthal DNA. Um, and about 3% of our genome is not eukaryotic, but is viral uh, DNA that we carry. So we have between 21 and 23,000 genes, most of which code for proton, uh, proteins. Um, 95% of the average protein coding gene in humans are those introns that we are going to pull out when we, after transcription. And a lot of the human genome we used to, before we really understood how genes were regulated and controlled, uh, were considered junk. That they did not code for an amino acid. They didn't code for a specific polypeptide. Uh, but turns out much of that codes for RNA and those RNA molecules can have regulatory effect in, uh, in cells, have a regulatory role. And a lot of that DNA uh, has a regulatory role. We also identified many polymorphisms. So poly is many bodies. So many identical or similar, uh, not identical, similar genes so multiples of the same gene, but with slight differences. So usually only by a single nucleotide. So a lot of the single nucleotide polymorphisms can change an individual's susceptibility to disease or response to a treatment. Structural genomics is knowing the base sequence. Uh, is followed by functional genomics. So structural, once we know the base sequence, well, what is it code for? And how is that product used um, is sort of the, the next step in genomics. So we know the structure of the eukaryotic genome. Historically, we thought of genes as a specific discrete unit of heredity. That's what we just learned as we went through our, <laughs> our unit on DNA and the expression of genes and the inheritance of genes. Prokaryotes typically have a single circular chromosome with their genes. Eukaryotes, we have multiple thread-like chromosomes with genes distributed along the length. And these are fragmented into exons. So the introns are what we considered the junk portion that are removed. Many of these code for RNA. And then we have these repetitive unique sequences of DNA that we're figuring out what they do. The intergenic sequences, these portions between DNA, often have repetitive elements. So we get the same sequence over and over with just very slight changes. And we see these intersp interspersed repeats. Uh, we think they can contribute, they have some role in the evolution of, evolution of new genes, see through transposons, uh, through alterations there. So transposons, are specific DNA sequences that are able to excise themselves and then move within different chromosomes. Uh, and so some of these repetitive units may be involved in evolution through transposition. And they are unique non-coding DNA, meaning they do not get transcribed into RNA and then translated into a protein. So our coding DNA is actually only about 2% of all of our DNA. When we look at transposons, uh, these are considered to probably play a role in evolution and change in changing our DNA and coming up with more variation, more varieties, because they can move between chromosomes. They can act as regulator genes uh, and by moving, they can change the phenotypes. They can change genes, 
changing genotypes, changing phenotypes. These were first identified in corn. Uh, it turns out you know, the more they're researched, the more we find them in other organisms like bacteria, flies, and humans. So here's a normal gene, a transposon that was snipped out, reversed, moved into a new location. Originally with the normal gene, this corn can code for the color purple. When we remove that, it can no longer, or we insert a transposon, reversed, and we can now no longer code for purple pigment. Which has led a lot of research to, researchers uh, to propose changing our definition of a gene. Um, these researchers think that we should have a definition that is more functional, that places the emphasis not from a site or a location on a chromosome to what, uh, what are the results of transcription. And so expanding that central dogma of DNA is transcribed to RNA is translated to a protein, one gene, one protein because gene products aren't necessarily proteins. Some of them just get transcribed to RNA and that RNA has a role in gene expression regulation uh, and so has other important useful products. Gene doesn't need to be on a single locus on a chromosome as transposons show. And any DNA sequence can result in one or more products depending on how it's transcribed, when it's transcribed, um, and also on, um, on methylation. So epigenetics is a new, a new area where our DNA remains the same, but some external source comes and latches on, usually a methyl group latches onto that gene and it alters what's expressed. So genetic material, doesn't necessarily have to be our DNA or the DNA in terms of genes that we think of. Functional genomics aims to understand the role of the genome in cells or organisms. Uh, DNA microarray arrays can monitor the expression of lots and lots and lots of genes all at the same time to tell us what genes are currently turned on or being expressed and what were the conditions that led to the expression of that gene? So we think about expression of genes. We don't want to turn on all our genes all the time and make all the products in our body all the time. Uh, so what regulates what's expressed when? Um, and different genes are expressed at different times based on what's available, maybe food sources or energy sources in our body, uh, or the time of our lives as we develop, we need certain products at certain times, and then we don't need them at other times in our life and during development. So uh, functional genomics is looking at why do we express what we express when and under what conditions. Comparative genomics compares human genome to other organisms. So we have model organisms that have uh, genetic mechanisms and cellular pathways in common with humans to see What's similar, what's different? So example, a scientist inserted a human gene associated with early onset Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease into the fruit flies, and the flies ended up showing symptoms. So those genes expressed similarly to how they do in humans. So maybe instead of using mice in the future, could use fruit flies to study different therapies that can be used for Parkinson's. So comparative genomics offers a way to study changes in the genome over time. Proteomics is the study of proteins. So the structure and function and the interaction of various cellular proteins. The entire collection of a species proteins, all the proteins a species can produce is the proteome. Turns out our proteome is larger than the genome. Uh, and that's because different mechanisms like alternative re-messenger RNA splicing, uh, reusing or using different portions of the RNA increases the number of possible proteins we can, uh, we can make with the same amount of DNA. So understanding protein function is essential to the development of better drugs for treating different diseases because they correlate, uh, drug treatment correlates to the particular genome. 
and we target proteins often because a lot of our disorders are based on proteins or the treatments need um, proteins to activate or deactivate or enter a cell to be effective for different treatments. And then once we know the primary structure of a protein, that amino acid sequence, it should be possible to predict its tertiary structure. Structure: How is it going to bend or twist in that secondary? What's the 3D shape of the tertiary? And if we have quaternary structure, how do those um, subunits come together? So computer modeling is really important in figuring out this bending and folding into a protein's final shape. And another big area of study, huge in fact, one of the fastest growing areas in biology is bioinformatics. It's the application of computer technologies, software, and statistical techniques to study biological information. So as you can imagine, genomics and proteomics produce lots and lots and lots and lots of raw data. And uh, these fields depend on computer analysis to find patterns in all that data. And so by looking at all our genetic data, genetic profiles, all the proteins we produce, um, can find relationships between those genes, between those uh, gene profiles and protein profiles and genetic disorders in order to find new treatments. So we need lots and lots of computational skills, mathematics skills, computer skills to, uh, to help analyze all the data that we now have the technology to generate. Okay, so that um, covers chapters 13 and 14 and gets us through all of the chapters for this unit test coming up this week. So post any questions you might have in the discussion or call, email, text, or DM me uh, if you have any questions, and good luck on the exam.